Okay, this video is for my best customer, but before we go any further, I think a little discussion on flame is appropriate. So we're going to look at some different types of flames here. This is a massive 200 kilowatt flame shooting out of the front of this thing here. And I've noticed in some of the footage you guys sent me, that's the flame you're running. What we have here is a smaller, oxygen-rich, high-velocity flame. And the reason this flame is important can be seen when we take a look inside the burner here. You see how that buildup that was produced from the very large flames is now red hot and burning away? That buildup over time can cause eddy currents that will induce a flame out. But when we're running in this lean condition, it's actually burning away. Let's take a look at what happens inside the burner when we switch from a lean high velocity flame to a rich low velocity massive flame. See how everything's no longer glowing? I have increased the flame exponentially and everything's turned black now inside the burner. The heat capacity or the specific heat of the fuel itself is absorbing a tremendous amount of energy from inside the combustion chamber inhibiting the process of self-cleaning. So I'm going to reduce the fuel, keep the air on as high as we can get it without a flame out. That's your goal. As high as this burner will burn without a flame out is where you want to set it. You see everything is now ignited and all of that buildup will burn away. And though the flame looks small, because of the high velocity flame, the amount of energy it's kicking out is comparable to those large flames. Very good way to go. Um, fellas this video is for my best customer he's an NDA customer so if the conversation gets a little vague that's what it's all about basically before this gets lost in the fluff I just want to point out right away that it is impossible to use an air pressure reading to determine the power input of a burner array or even using a chart to do so the reason being is not only does the flow rate change depending on the pressure head of the tank the fuel level but during operation of these burners, one has to adjust the fuel valve. You have to adjust the fuel valve when you're dialing in these burners at every level of its operating parameter. So to think that we can just adjust the air pressure and have one standard set fuel setting is just not plausible. It's not recommended at all. So before this gets lost in the fluff, I just wanted to point out that um, our plan's not going to work. This test proves that but I didn't want this little piece of information to get buried in all the details. So we're gonna have to go with fuel flow rate. We absolutely cannot use air pressure to determine the power input of your pyrolyzers or the fractional distillation system by using air pressure alone. There are too many variables that change the flow rate. The second the operator moves the fuel valve to give us the optimum burn, it's going to change the flow rate. You'll have to have a curve chart for every air setting and every level of the tank, which is not practical. It's far easier. We're just going to go with one of these. We're going to get a liter per hour flow gauge that goes up to 50, 60 liters per hour. 60 liters per hour will enable you to monitor up to 600 kilowatts of power input or output, whatever way you want to look at it. Okay, so here we're going to do a little demonstration of how I populated our graph. Basically, I just monitor the fuel change using a stopwatch, and I would also look at the pressure we're operating at, and then use this information to input in a function or a formula, mathematical formula. And that's basically done like this. We have 90 PSI, 37 seconds divided by 3,600 seconds, that's in an hour, gives us 92.2. So we multiply that figure by the 50 milliliters that were registered at the 37 second point, and that gives us 4,864 milliliters, 4.8 liters basically an hour. So going from that, we can see that the function or formula we use is 3600 divided by change in time multiplied by the change in volume in milliliters divided by 1000. That gives us the liters per hour. So that's pretty much how this graph was populated. And throughout the process, I checked um, these figures at different fuel levels. 
and come to find out that the readings change depending on the fuel level in the tank significantly. So here we are ramping up to full power on the burner. Gets us to about 70 kilowatts, I think it was. 78 kilowatts, maybe. It's a high velocity flame there. This is pure waste oil, by the way. I did that so we could see the flame best. I don't have any conditions of low lighting available right now. So basically that's just the gist of it. We went through, we monitored fuel consumption and so forth. Right here we have the results of an analysis that was done to determine the difference in fuel rate readings based on the amount of time that was allowed to pass through each test. In the beginning we tried 26 seconds, which gave us 50 milliliters, producing 6.9 liters per hour, or 69 kilowatts, and so on and so forth. You can see here, by the time we got to 290 seconds, we started to lose pressure hit, so therefore the flow rate will decrease. All of these were done in the same test simultaneously, just checking the times at different portions. We would expect to see a hyperbolic line. The higher the back pressure on your nozzle, the less flow rate. Eventually, when let's say you get the 500 psi's when the valve's closed, I mean, there's going to be no flow. In this case, we're going to be topping out at 120 to 200 psi's. I've got the regulator set at 120, so we're at zero liters per minute at 120 psi's. However, because of pressure head, we took these readings at different levels of the tank. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Because I did not monitor the level from 100 mil or 1,000 milliliters every time and then take the data, we came up with an erratic pattern on our curve. As the head of the fluid drops, the pressure head, the flow rate also will drop in proportion to that change of pressure head. Because we are finding alterations in flow, for instance, there's a point where 90 psi's matches up with the 100 psi or 110 psi's in flow rate based on tank level. So using a set air pressure to modulate flow will be impossible my friend. This analysis is showing us the error in that approach. But I knew we had to do this analysis to actually see what's going to happen. We will need a flow gauge like this. This is an air flow gauge and will not work for fluid. However, I have a fluid flow gauge en route. So what we would do is we would use the fluid flow gauge to modulate the output of the burners. This particular flow gauge and the one that I'm ordering also has a knob directly on it. So an operator of the um, fractional distillation system or of the pyrolyzers could just walk up and modulate this knob that's connected to every burner and that would give him a liter per minute output so essentially what it comes down to is every liter per hour you burn is 10,000 watts of power it fluctuates a little bit in between fuels but this is the diesel fuel power and, and the waste oil. It's, they're all real close to that. That's a good enough approximation in my opinion. You can find out the actual kilojoule output of your fuel in many different ways. We won't get into that in this video. But in an example, let's say you burn 16 liters per hour. We multiply 16 by 10,000. We get 160,000. We divide that by a thousand and come up with 160 kilowatts. Basically just knock off three zeros off the number you come up with. And that's your kilowatt output. So what we would do is put a chart next to your guys' flow meter on your pyrolyzer and on your fractional distillation system. Okay? And we'd have our flow gauge here doing its thing with this little knob. And then maybe right next to it we have a card. And we have the liters per minute marked on the card. Maybe it should go this way. One, two. Well, let's think about this. You've got a very large system in place. So we're going to want to give you a lot of room here. Let's go 
10, 20, 30, 40, 50. I know you guys are running some serious power. So we'll say, we'll put the kilowatt card just right next to it there. So that wherever the little flow gauge is on liters per hour, we just make a little corresponding card to go right next to it. To it. Or maybe the operator could over time memorize these specs and could know that at 50 liters per hour, you're at 500 kilowatts. So, there you have it guys. Um, I hope that helps you out in your operation. Um, this, this test should thoroughly show how we absolutely cannot use air pressure as a means of helping the operator set the power input. It's so when it comes to testing, it is advisable one take many data sets, but intuition is just screaming in our face here. It's blatantly obvious that we can't use air pressure as a means of determining flow rate simply by making a calibrated chart. We can make a calibrated chart that will work for your system. That what the operator could do is set everything when the tank is full. Because if you've got a pretty big tank, it's going to take a while for that tank level to change. So we can do this. But if we're going to use a large tank, we kind of need to uh, use one of these to determine the flow rate. So it completely just obliterates the whole point and not just buying one of these and just going off of this all right this is my recommendation to you in accordance with your request for a curve chart for the most part we're going to take care of that this is what we're going to want to do we're going to want to go with the flow gauge it could end up taking a really long time to populate a list like this by determining the flow rate of your tank at every level so Tell me what you guys think. I say we abandon the chart altogether. We get a flow gauge like this. We do the mathematics to determine the corresponding kilowatt output. And throughout the day, as the tank level drops, guys, the operator is going to want to come over here and adjust this knob. All right, fellas, just want to sneak this in here real quick. We haven't even started messing with fuel valves yet. Okay, you have to adjust the fuel valves to dial in these burners just right. So the second we touch that fuel valve while we're dialing all this in, our little charts information is just going to fly out the window. The correlation is going to change. We would have to have a curved chart for every level of the tank, you know, within six inches and for every fuel setting and every air setting. So the second you change that fuel setting, all of our air setting correlations change. So having a fuel flow rate is going to be the way we determine the power input to the device. That way the operator can go over and set the burner and then look at the, the input. If it's too high, he can go back over and reduce it. The air setting has to be perfectly adjusted to the fuel setting every time. We can't just adjust air pressure and go with that flame. A lot of bad things will happen. One of them is, is your burners can foul out. We kind of want to keep these burners running pretty hot. Having a really long, big flame shooting out the top isn't necessarily necessary. We can have a high velocity flame, high temperature, high velocity flame and get the same effect without fouling out our burners. But that's just one thing I wanted to point out. We're going to have to go with the fuel flow situation that way no matter what the air valve set on no matter what the fuel valve set on we will be able to walk over and get a quick glance at the fuel flow and then quickly determine the kilowatt input based on that now in regards to our other discussion I'm not going to say a lot about this but this is basically something i highly highly recommend you do um, this is the simplest way to get agitation in there and you're also going to mitigate any carburization or 
buildup, so to say. Kind of like cooking a pot of soup. If you don't stir the soup, you get all that stuff burnt up and built up on the bottom of the pot. And not only is that bad for the soup and the taste, but now the heat's being blocked. So you're wasting tremendous amounts of heat from that buildup. A thrusted flow should mitigate that. Now, the amount of thrust you're getting and all that stuff is going to be important. Do not make this stuff spin unless you put baffles up top. That's a lot of work. That requires a lot of dangerous work, I might add. The whole thing's dangerous. You, like, implementing this is not going to be safe. There, there are some ways it could be done, but you're going to have to weld on this tank, which means that I had to be drained and cleaned. So... Don't expect you to jump right on this, but <laughs> just a suggestion to keep the burners. I think that if you don't do this, you're going to end up having to scrape the bottom of this tank anyway. I could be totally wrong. I could be wrong. But maybe it would benefit a guy to scrape the bottom of this thing and see what's going on down there. Now, to avoid any dangerous hot work, if you guys have a hatch connected to this system we could connect some plumbing to this hatch that would allow us to attach the plumbing to the hatch away from the tank we could then bring the hatch back in place lower the tubes in and connect the plumbing after bolting the hatch back on that would avoid the need to drain the tank all kinds of stuff you could even um, do a quick swap by Maybe building a second hatch that has the tubing on it already. So all you got to do is shut the system down, hurry up, take the hatch off, throw the new hatch on. Within, you know, half hour, you got your fractional distillation system up and running again.